John? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Go for it. Uh, this is the Wednesday, January 10th, 2018 meeting of the Northampton City Council. My name is Ryan O'Donnell. I'm the City Council President, and I will be presiding tonight. We'll begin with a period of public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the public to speak on any issue you wish. There are a couple of ground rules. Uh, first is we ask you to keep your comments to three minutes or less. Our rules prevent us from engaging in a back and forth with you during public comment. It's your time to give your opinion to us. Uh, I'd also ask that throughout the council meeting, uh, there be silence in the chamber. If you have conversations to have, uh, please take it outside of the chamber so not to disrupt uh, the other speakers who have come to give their opinions today. The only other special request I would give today is because this is a special meeting of the City Council. Uh, the scheduling was a little tricky, and I know that there are some councilors with commitments later in the evening. So I won't limit public comment, but you may decide that brevity is the soul of wit um, and take that into consideration when you gauge how long uh, to speak. But with that, we'll start, and I have a sign-up sheet here. Uh, and Blair Gimma is the first person. If you would give your name and address for the record, please. Uh, my name is Blair Gimma, and I live at 3 Clark Avenue. Um, good evening. Uh, we have a continuous statement to make that represents the views of a number of people here tonight, as well as many who are not able to be in the room with us. In past meetings, we have collectively engaged in an intensive, extensive evidence-based deliberative process where many points were shared. The facts established have not changed. It was established that cameras don't deter crime, that they are costly to install and maintain, and that any footage captured by police surveillance cameras would be accessible to ICE and other federal agencies. It was also established that due to Homeland Security giving grants directly to the police departments, the City Council would not have fiscal oversight to prevent cameras from being installed. Many, many community members also share data and personal stories that show the harm that surveillance cameras would cause to our downtown area, the people who spend time there and all of our civil liber liberties. We know you have heard these points before and taken them seriously as evidence by your vote to pass the ordinance. Since we were last together, the mayor vetoed the ordinance that you had passed, an ordinance that emerged from a rich democratic process marked by an embrace of compromise and which incorporated ample revisions from numerous stakeholders, including input from the chief of police. Um, when we started this, I had short hair and uh, <laughs> tell how the uh, time has passed. Um, when the mayor vetoed this ordinance, after his long absence from the previous process, an absence also marked by a refusal to meet with concerned constituents, he proposed an idea for a different ordinance, a heavily revised, very different version of your own. He framed this veto as a revision and a compromise, yet a closer dissection of the mayor's proposed ordinance leads to a different conclusion. Thank you very much. Uh, Jessica Johnson, please. Hi. Um, as you know, my name is Jess Johnson. I live in Ward 7. Um, I'll be reading the second part of this four-part statement. So for starters, a veto is not a compromise. While the mayor affixed a revised ordinance to his veto, the executive does not have the power to revise the law at this stage. In vetoing the ordinance and putting forward an alternate version, the mayor proposes to begin this legislative process around the question of surveillance cameras in Northampton anew. We want to remind you that tonight is about the ordinance that you already passed, not about a hypothetical ordinance that might exist in the future. But to the extent that folks may be potentially viewing the two in connection, we think it's really important to clarify the important distinctions um, between the ordinance that you passed and the mayor's idea for a different ordinance. First, while the mayor's proposal on first glance may appear to limit cameras, it in fact expressly allows them. The approval process envisioned by the mayor would grant the executive branch and the police chief extended and ongoing power to propose the installation of cameras. 
Crucially, in doing so, it irrevocably changes the spirit of your city council ordinance from one that takes a stance against surveillance to one that permits it. Or as attorney Dana Goldblatt put it in a public statement issued earlier today, your ordinance says no cameras. The mayor's proposal allows cameras, which is the opposite of no cameras. Also troubling, the mayor's version would allow for cameras on and potentially inside of all municipally owned buildings without prior approval by city council. <coughs> this would include buildings where we vote. Um, it would include the steps of city hall, this the precise location that's at the heart of our city's political life. The camera mounted on City Hall could also effectively record the majority of our main street. Thank you very much. Um, Sigrid Smalter, please. Hi, I'm Sigrid Schmaltzer, and I live in Ward 3. I'm continuing the statement. Further, there is nothing in the mayor's version that would enable City Council to stop the police from using live monitoring, facial recognition, and tracking <coughs> technologies. While Chief Casper has assured the city that she has no intention to do this, the council would not be able to prevent a future chief from enabling such technology. Once a camera is approved, the way it is deployed is not subject to oversight by the council. In fact, the mayor's new ordinance includes no assurance that such changes in the use of the technology would even require the police department or mayor's office to notify the council, much less the public. And the lack of a sunset provision also means that it will be very difficult to take down cameras once they are installed. Finally, the mayor's ordinance contains no safeguards inhibiting federal agencies, including ICE and the FBI, from accessing the footage. As has been discussed extensively in these meetings, it is not possible to prevent this. As one counselor has rightly pointed out to us, these technologies and the possibility of footage ending up in the hands of federal agencies are similarly not addressed in the council's ordinance. However, there is a crucial difference. The council's ordinance makes it much less likely that cameras would be installed in the first place, rendering these concerns moot. And because the city council ordinance creates a, much, a more intensive process for the approval of cameras, the overturning of the law or the introduction of a new ordinance, there will be ample opportunity for the council to introduce the necessary regulations safeguarding the city from these technologies. If a counselor were to introduce legislation banning these technologies in the existing cameras, or if you were to introduce a measure extending the downtown restrictions throughout the city, we will endorse this fully. But this should happen after this ordinance passes, rather than by starting the process anew. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sarah Field, please. I'm Sarah Field, and I live at 40 Elizabeth Street. I'm in Ward 3. Uh, and I will be concluding the shared statement. Finally, regarding the process by which new cameras could be proposed and installed, the council has pointed out that we make law not with the current police chief and mayor in mind, both of whom are rightfully widely respected, but with the knowledge that the people in these positions will change over time. We also make law not with the current council in mind, but with an awareness of our changing political landscape and council makeup. Your original version includes much stronger safeguards against a proliferation of cameras that could arise with a new council and as we enter into new and uncertain political times. In summary, the mayor's version fails to restrict surveillance or stand up for sanctuary. Instead, it undermines both the spirit and impact of the city council ordinance an ordinance that limits cameras, makes a statement about our community's values, upholds our commitment to sanctuary and civil rights. We, the people of Northampton, urge the council to stand by its ordinance and cast its vote for the override. Out of respect for your time, there are many of us tonight who will not be speaking or sharing public comment. But instead, mm -hmm. I'd like to invite all of those who would like to show support for the override of the mayor's veto and the approval of the ordinance to please raise your hands now. In addition, we want to honor the voices of the many people who are not able to be here in the room today. Earlier today, we emailed you copies of a petition that was circulated this week and has been signed by over 260 community members as of this time. We hope you had a chance to review the many comments shared by your constituents, and I have hard copies here for your review with additional signatures that have been received since we sent you the email a few hours ago. Um, in addition, I also have a quick reference guide to the differences between the mayor's proposal and your original ordinance. 
Thank you for your time, attention, and diligence throughout this extended process. Please do the right thing and vote to override the mayor's veto. Thank you very much. Amy Bookbinder is next, please. Hello, again. Um, Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue. First, I have a question. Um, I wonder if you all saw Trump's statement today, bragging about all the regulations and other good work done by Obama and the Congress that he's undone in his first year, with the Republican-led Congress letting him do it. I, and I suspect many of you and all here tonight, have been appalled watching him undo good legislation. <clears throat> many throughout <clears throat> our city don't want you, our legislative body, our voice, to let the mayor undo your hard work. Given everything that you've heard tonight and over the past months, it could not be more clear that it's, it is not just your right, but your obligation to override the veto. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, James Winston. Hi. Um, James Winston, uh, Ward 2. Um, I, I've spoken my, in the past. My, my feelings, uh, along with many people in the business community, that that safety cameras offer a number, a number of benefits to this city. And, and I'm not going to go through it all because this council did pass the ordinance. Um, I do want you to to consider for for a moment why we see some of the colleges just here in the five. College area, UMass, uh, Smith College, Westfield State uh, nearby have recently uh, put in place many, many um, safety cameras across their campus. <coughs> they do this for a reason, for multiple reasons, for deterrence, and they do this as, as, a, as a safety measure so that if something does happen on their campus, they'll have a better chance of being able to, to solve that particular crime. And, and Make no mistake, they do help the police do their job. They, they absolutely give the police the tools to do their job more effectively. But I want to call to your attention the wonderful guest column that was written by Ward 2 Councilor Dennis Bidwell uh, right after. Uh, the mayor, it wasn't just a veto. It was a proposal um, going forward. and. As Councillor Bidwell correctly pointed out, that the mayor's um, version actually meets the people that are against the safety cameras. They meet more than halfway. There's several conditions in there. As somebody that thinks that the cameras should be uh, wherever the city needs them, uh, the mayor's plan actually goes, um, I, I believe, much further to the side that opposes the cameras. And, but as Councillor Bidwell points out, it's, it's, a, it's a means to a compromise. And in law school, when it, what, one of the things they tell you when you're negotiating deals, contracts, agreements, the best compromises are the ones where both sides of the issue walk away feeling a little bit unhappy. And that's because if one side is just thrilled with the agreement or the deal, it, it, it means that the other side probably didn't get, uh, get a good deal and they got the short end of the stick. In this case, what the mayor proposes is, is really perfect in a way. Uh, certainly the people that are, are in favor of the safety cameras were not thrilled and obviously the people that, that uh, oppose it, they're, they're not happy either. It's a, it's a way to bridge a gap. There's obviously a divide in the city. We've heard from Suzanne Beck from the chamber uh, advocating for the cameras. I would ask you to consider the mayor's proposal, which is extremely <laughs> ask you to accept it. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Reed Arrowhood. Thank you. 
My name is Reed Arhood. Uh, I live at 35 Clark Street in Ward, Ward 6. Um, I want to thank you for uh, all for your time in this lengthy process. Uh, it's been very thoughtful. It's been very engaging. And the mayor has been largely absent. Uh, his proposal for uh, a compromise is not a compromise at all. It's a different ordinance altogether that would allow, expressly allow cameras on our municipal buildings, um, places where our community gathers, our political processes happen. Um, these would target minorities. They would criminalize poverty. They would criminalize addiction. Um, and they're not there to keep us safe. They are there as surveillance. Um, I urge you to override the veto tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Billy Lynn Plouffe. Hello and thank you. My name is Billy Lynn Plouffe. I am part of Ward 6. My address is 35 Clark Street, Florence, Massachusetts. There are two ways to kill a human, in spirit and in body. In our society, in our American society, we kill spirit through incarceration and imprisonment based off of social deviancy, not necessarily crime as many will let you believe. The best way to kill spirit is through humiliation. And I know humiliation because I have experienced humiliation and spirit death firsthand. Um, when I was 21, I was kicked out of home and shunned by my family for a short time because of my gender transition. Um, many of my friends left during that transition. I am here today to save others from the humiliation I have endured as a social deviant due to my gender nonconformity. People in power use social deviancy as an excuse to murder the soul. We have many who are socially deviant in Northampton who are not criminals. These cameras are symbolic of our progression towards the killing of hundreds who are homeless, people of color, LGBT spectrum folks, and the disabled through dehumanization. Criminals kill bodies in dark alleys and behind closed doors. We kill the spirit in our open streets under the eyes of our oppressors through, excuse me. Please do not allow cameras in Northampton. Please do not allow a compromise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Dana Goldblatt. statement from uh, attorney Bill Newman that I'd like to read. Uh, I think his name is signed up, so it, would it be better if I read his statement now or do mine now? I, I, you want to read his statement during your time? Or? Can I do his statement during my time and then sort of go over if it goes over with mine? Sure. Go, go right ahead. Right, no, okay, thank you. Uh, this is the statement of Bill Newman, uh, who's uh, our ACLU attorney. You all are familiar with him. My wife, Dale, and I will be on our way to Logan, uh, on our way to visit our daughter who lives in Africa at the time of the city council meeting this afternoon. But I want the council to know that I support a vote in favor of the override and urge you to vote in favor of the override. I explained my reasons at length on my radio show this morning. On that show, I referenced the excellent op-ed piece in today's Hampshire Daily Gazette. I assume that others coming before the council tonight will highlight many of the salient points made there. Likewise, I am sure that many people can explain in detail why the mayor's proposal, while helpful to the extent that it would cover the entire city, is a proposal that itself will require an enormous amount of time, energy, and debate. And that is a point which I think is appropriate to emphasize. On this ordinance, the council has done an excellent work. The ordinance you passed is a good and carefully crafted piece of legislation. In that regard, I would note that carping about its title or the headings is not a valid criticism. In interpreting a statute or an ordinance, those words have no bearing. If the override doesn't pass, the city and the city council will be back to square one on this issue. There will be nothing to show for over four months of intense community and legislative study and work. All that time and effort will have been mounted to nothing. 
If the override vote were to fall short today, the necessary consequence is that an enormous amount of more time and effort necessary will have to be spent and focused on this issue. The ordinance as passed protects immigrants and members of marginalized communities in our city. It keeps Northampton a welcoming place. It reinforces our community as a sanctuary city. It says that we are a community that values everyone. It is a good law. I hope the time where we can come together and agree that we have addressed this issue of governmental surveillance of us uh, and the sharing of what would be captured by that surveillance among all federal and state enforcement agencies in a meaningful and a thoughtful way has come. I trust that in the future, should amendments be necessary, that will be thoroughly and thoughtfully considered. I believe that it is time to bring good and considered legislative work to fruition by voting yes. Thank you for your consideration, Bill Newman. Uh, and my name is Dana Goldblatt. I live at uh, 140 William Street. And I just wanted to address the issue of compromise, which has come up over and over again in response to the veto. First, a veto is not a compromise. And if you want to have a compromise, that's not how you start the conversation. So I want to not call this a compromise. That's not a compromise. I also just want to address the issue of whether a compromise is appropriate at this point. Before you have a compromise, there have to be two valid positions making points that are equivalent. And then you compromise between them. There has never been a coherent, data-driven, rational case for mounting 24-7 high-definition surveillance cameras in downtown Northampton, Massachusetts. It never happened. There was a public meeting where the police chief asked if people would Could I have another minute to? Go right ahead. Well, you can have one minute, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, asked how people felt. They said that they thought it was a terrible idea. Then there was an ordinance proposed to, uh, to, to basically ban the new cameras, and everyone loved it. People came out of the woodwork saying how great it was and that we thought this was the right response to the, the trial balloon that had been floated. And the reasons that we brought forward were evidence-based and data-driven. We had professors and sociologists, and everyone came out saying, yeah, that's the right thing to do. We don't need cameras in downtown Northampton. The response was never, here's a lot of research that shows that cameras are really important to solving crime. The response was, well, I don't like your tone. <laughs> and then we said, well, we don't know what you mean because you weren't at the meeting, so why do you not like our tone? And then the response was, well, we don't like your tone, and we think it's important that you compromise to prove that you have a nicer tone. <laughs> and I was like, well, what about the part where you say why this is a good thing? You point to evidence where you say this has, helps anything that we want to do in Northampton. And we skipped that part. And then, uh, then there was a wave of people who came out saying, the police chief says it's good, so we should support her. As if that's how to do data-driven policy, when the police chief had actually said she doesn't believe in research as a way of deciding. She just feels like cameras are nice. Feeling like cameras are nice is not something to compromise. It's not, some, it's not something we need to compromise with. So okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we'll move to Emma Rose Roderick, please. Is Emma Rose Roderick in the chambers? Okay. So that's the last on this sheet. We're going to check if there's another. A few more names here. Um, I think Bill Newman just spoke um, using some kind of telepathic process. Um, Al Griggs, please. Good evening. My name is Al Griggs. I live at Nine Barrett Place. In spite of editorials that have been in the Gazette and the excellent columns that have been written by Dennis Bidwell and others, and the mayor's attempt to find a compromise to the resolution that was approved by the city council, it is probable that the city council will override the mayor's veto and ban additional surveillance cameras. I hope that upon reflection, the council will recognize the value of not immediately taking a position on an issue, but using a reasonable time to enable thoughtful discussion and dialogue about an issue. In my experience, I have found that often a process one follows is more important than the decision itself. 
It seems to me that were the matter of surveillance cameras to have been decided at the last council meeting in December, after extensive community input and decision, and the decision would have been accepted as being more than just an immediate reaction to the chief's initial request when the ordinance was originally drafted in September. I hope that going forward, the council will be more deliberate when considering potentially controversial issues and encourage among themselves and the community thoughtful discussion and deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. And now, uh, Sally Griggs, please. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Sally Griggs. I also live at Nine Barrett Place in Northampton. <coughs> and I am here to speak in favor of Mayor Narkowitz's veto. I would like, um, I think he took a very careful look at it and his common ground revisions are worth thinking about. Um, despite what some people in this room might think, there are lots of people in Northampton who are in favor of cameras. Uh, this is not a one-sided issue whatsoever. Um, I also agree with the mayor's uh, revised ordinance that would meet the approval of Police Chief Casper. Uh, we, I have read in the paper that the morale in the police station is low. I don't like that. I think we should support our police. And so I think the revisions, if she's in favor of them, are good. I feel it is very important to support her and her team. I have lived in Northampton for 46 years, and the Northampton of 2018 is very different than it was in 1972. Much of it is vibrant, exciting, healthy, and flourishing, and diverse. But there is also a darker, scary side that has emerged. Drugs and drug dealing are a sad fact of life here and do not represent the wholesome community values that we raised our children with. After I spoke against the ordinance in December, I received a phone call from an old acquaintance whom I had served with on the Friends of Forbes Library. She is elderly. I hadn't spoken with her in 20 years, and she just wanted to thank me for having the guts to speak up for her and her friends, most of whom, she said, will no longer come downtown because of they are scared. So again, I urge all the counselors to remember all the citizens of Northampton and to try to do the greatest good for the greatest number of us. Please let the mayor's veto stand and let's all work together towards a compromise. Thank you very much. So that concludes the people that I have signed up. Uh, are there any who um, haven't spoken who would like to provide public comment? Why don't you just come forward if you do want to provide public comment? Give your name and address for the record and the floor. Yes. Yeah. I'm Jeffrey Kuhn. I live at 30 West Street in Havley. I used to live in Northampton. Um, I think the question we're addressing today has gone a little bit beyond whether or not we want cameras in downtown Northampton. I think there's been thorough discussion of that question in this room over the past however many months. Um, I want to start by thanking the organizers who have done so much work on this issue and have volunteered hundreds of hours of their time. Uh, but I think the question that's really uh, relevant tonight is how does our democracy work? Um, and I've been to four or five of these meetings, and every time there's been a room this packed or more, um, and I think the people of Northampton have made their will very evident. Um, we've heard from like a couple people in each meeting from the business community who are like on the opposite side, but like doesn't, doesn't take a lot to figure out where the majority is. Um, and so I think in making this decision about whether to override the veto of a single person, um, 
the question tonight is not do we want cameras in downtown Northampton or not. It's um, who do you all serve and who do you all protect? Thank you very much. Please. Hello, honorable council members. I know most of you. I'm Douglas Ross, and I live in the city of East Hampton. I used to live in Northampton. And I wasn't going to say anything. <coughs> I was going to remain quiet and listen to everybody, what they had to say. But after I heard someone say that people are afraid to be in downtown Northampton, I think it's BS. Because I come from a city, Springfield, Massachusetts, which is, in fact, has high crime has a lot of problems, has drug dealers, all of that stuff, and people are afraid to go downtown. Northampton is not one of those places. Northampton is one of the safest towns that I've ever lived in in my entire life. I have never felt unsafe being downtown, and I come from a city where there are, in fact, cameras and shot spotters, and the crime has not reduced. The crime is still the same as it has been before I left Springfield, and it will probably be the same after I decide to leave Massachusetts and move to Vermont or whatever. I also, want, I also want to say also, too, that I am a person with autism spectrum disorder, and I'm saying this publicly. And people who have autism act and behave in a certain way that is not considered to be normal. I think I said this the last time at the meeting, if somebody was downtown, if they were acting suspicious or whatever, that the cameras would look at them and say, hey, what is that person doing? There are a lot of people in downtown Northampton that would be considered by other town standards to be weird and abnormal. But that's OK in Northampton, because you, know, you get to know the people. I, I know several of the people who are homeless. I know some of the people who have mental illness. And you get to know them. Cameras are not a way of building community in a small town that's only 29,000 people. This town does not have a lot of crime. Yes, Northampton has problems like anywhere else. It's not perfect. Nowhere is perfect. But to say that Northampton is to a point where we need cameras is absurd to me. And I am tired of the rhetoric from people who I would label neoliberals who say, oh, um, I don't like the tone that you're using. I don't like the fact that you're anti-police. Nobody is anti-police. I'm certainly not anti-police. Just because I criticize the police department, I criticize public officials, does not mean that I, that I am anti-governmental institution. I come from a law enforcement family on my father's side of the family. My great uncle, um, Sal Chafin, was the chief of police of UMass Amherst in the 1970s. So I am not anti-police. I am not anti-government. But what I am is I am anti-unnecessary things that we don't need. If I fought for a second, if I fought for a second that Northampton was anything like Springfield, I would be the first one to say, yes, we need cameras. But we don't need cameras in Northampton. We are not an unsafe community at all. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Would anyone else like to provide public comment? Just come on up. You could you can kind of cue as long as you can do it safely there in the middle. Just come on up. Uh, good evening, counselors. My name is Andrew Brew. I live in Middle Street in Florence, Massachusetts. And um, I would like to make a very simple point, which echoes uh, a couple of points that other people have made, including uh, a very dear friend of mine. Um, for every meeting, dozens of people have brought up studies on the efficacy of cameras in urban spaces stopping crime, which is to say it's not, it's not a very good method of trying to do that rather than addressing the actual root cause of crime itself. Um, economic issues, drug issues in terms of rehabilit rehabilitating people and access to those sorts of things. Um, people have also shared their personal stories and have raised valid concerns from all sectors of, of you know, our small town economy from workers, immigrants, so on and so forth. Uh, more interesting to me is the outpouring of support for the ordinance. Um, now, we supposedly live in a democracy, and you, the counselors, were elected to represent the, the will of the majority, who I think have consistently attended the meeting and made the statement as to where they stand on this particular issue. Um, so my, my point to you is, do you also like 
like Jeffrey was saying, do you think that we should operate as a democracy? Are you going to respect the will of the majority of the people who have spoken in, in their support for the ordinance? Or will you let the mayor and a, and a, and a minority of people, admittedly from the business community and, uh, and in other places as well, dictate the terms of the, the way the majority of people should live in this town? Um, and in addition, and to, the, and to sort of reiterate on the whole uh, aspect of crime, um, if you really cared about public safety, if you really cared about addressing crime, you would try to address it through jobs, through education, through spending on money that actually has shown through data that is actually effective in reducing crime as opposed to a stopgap measure and a Band-Aid that actually just displaces crime and doesn't, doesn't address the root cause. Um, so if you care about those things, those are the sorts of legislations I would like to see put forward. The camera uh, legislation does not do that. And I'll just leave it at that. Thank you. Next. Hi. I think uh, my name is Patrick <laughs> Burke. Um, I currently live in Holyoke, but was uh, lived in Northampton for three years. And uh, I'm president of the Hampshire Franklin Central Labor Council, and I'm also on the board of the PBTA as the rider representative, uh, where I'm um, happy to work with uh, many of you in different capacities. So I did come to, uh, to ask uh, for the council to override the veto. Um, you know, I think, you know, other people may have probably have already said it more eloquently than me, but, you know, the, you know you, as, a, as a city um, or a community, there are, you do have limited ability to take on these larger issues. So, I, you know, obviously, I think, I think most people would say, like, well, you know, yes, uh, crime is bad, poverty is bad, but what can we do? We're only a city or town. We have financial constraints. We don't have that much power. Um, but some ways, you know, the power you have is, is to make a decision not to do what um, is often um, suggested, is to actually say, like, you know what, we're going to not go with the conventional wisdom that is coming from other powerful institutions and, and folks who think that, well, this is inevitable. Um, this is your opportunity to take a, you know, not just a moral stand, but to kind of say, like, you know what, you know, sometimes public policy debates are giving us options that don't actually make sense, that aren't really addressing the problems. And by having this kind of public uh, debate, um, people are able to kind of start to think about, well, this is, a, this is allowing everyone to kind of see a realm of political uh, issues and problems and to think more creatively how to solve them because they're not all gonna, they're not going to be solved you know in this room necessarily but they can be solved you know at the legislature in our in our community through other other things so i think again just by simply saying you know what you know we have to override the veto not allow cameras to come in is 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 a, is an act of bravery which is saying that we can actually be more creative about how to solve public policy problems there's been a large debate around mass incarceration, where finally people are saying, you know what, that didn't work. We spent billions and billions of dollars to, you know, apprehend people, and it has not worked to solve crime, to solve drug issues. And that was a long overdue debate, and it was very difficult, and many people had to take a risk in order to actually begin to have that discussion. So I think this is important to, to make this stand, not just because of, uh, and not just because of the merits of the issue in this community, but because this is allowing us to actually get beyond some very tiring debates and think about the actual issues that we need to confront in terms of poverty, in terms of low-wage jobs, in terms of a lack of options for us to do economic development that embraces everyone and helps us all. So again, I urge you to do uh, to you know override the veto and, and take some courage. And I thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, Ms. Oppenheim, were you lining up? Yeah, I think. <coughs> let's have, let's have Miss. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, come on up. Hi, everyone. My name is Manny Pintaro. As you guys know me, I'm from uh, 248 Amherst Road in Sunderland. Mayor Northwicks, remember this? We were the first here in Northampton. We were actually the century city. Sir? So Sir, would you address your comments to the okay. council, please? So we passed this on this together. Okay, um, just, just um, what my friends have said. Um, right here, we are here because we are a community. We are not here just to say, you are right, you are wrong, you spoke this way, you spoke that way. We are a community who need to be together 
And if there's a way for us to be together, we have to respect your decision. You made a decision on the earth. You have come with ways that you understood your community. You understood the, the way in the plight of what's happening. And you said, yes, we agree with you, and we are going to vote on it. Now, Mayor Narcovitz have all the right to veto it. And everybody who's here, who they think Nor Northampton is a dangerous city, they can think that way. But it's about unity. It's about thinking what else we can do for the community in Northampton. Northampton has a lot of homeless people. We could use that money to help the homeless. We could use that money to help health care. Why are we arguing about this? I just don't understand. And one last thing I want to say is, OK, there's, there's those cameras in the five colleges. And believe me, I. I put a survey for a lot of students, which they didn't know they were w being watched. I'm starting a petition to override those cameras on the five colleges. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other public comment, please. Just give your name and address for the record. Hi, my name is Jamila Gore. I live at 51 Village Hill Road. Um, I just want to ditto everything that everybody else said about the overriding the veto. I think we've had a lot of discussion about this ordinance. We've come to some compromises about this ordinance. And I don't think our city needs <coughs> cameras and surveillance by the police. Because I feel safe in this city as a single black woman walking around the streets at night. And what would make me not feel safe is to be surveilled and criminalized by the police. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment, just come on, come on up. Good evening, my name is Jamie Winnell. I live in Hadley, but I used to live and work in Northampton. I still work in Northampton. A list of things we need more of in Northampton. <coughs> Conflict resolution trainings, racial justice, elder care with dignity, child care, a variety of therapies, community centers, more open space, affordable transportation, accessible housing, translators and interpreters, libraries, swim centers, language classes, safe houses. You get the idea. A list of things we do not need. More prisons, more cameras, more handcuffs. We need to look after each other, not just look at each other. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to provide public comment? <coughs> No? Last call? Yes, sir. Come on up. <coughs> Hello. Uh, my name is Eamon Edge, and I live on Summer Street here in Northampton. Um, I'm here to speak against the idea of the city installing permanent surveillance cameras and against the mayor's veto and revised compromise. At the last meeting where this was discussed, I spoke about how much I enjoy living in Northampton, uh, how safe I feel. <clears throat> and that I really dig it. It's great living here. Um, and this is in no, yeah, this is in part because uh, for all intents and purposes, I enjoy a privilege that I don't, I haven't earned. Um, I'm seen often as a straight white guy and I walk through life that way and no one really takes a second look at me, especially police or other agencies. <clears throat> um, and it's the least that I can do to talk about how these cameras uh, could cause a harmful impact to my fellow Northampton neighbors, visitors, shoppers, and those that work here, and their families and loved ones. <clears throat> it's easy to think of the cameras as no big deal or that it may add safety to downtown. When I read about the proposal, I had those thoughts myself at first. But after learning more about the proposal and discussing it with friends and fellow residents, I quickly and solidly knew that while I may not be greatly impacted myself, others could be. <clears throat> That's the first thing I would like to call out to everybody this evening. Northampton would be doing a disservice to many people who live, work, and visit by creating an environment where there's even a chance that they or someone close to them could be harmed. They could be separated from family. <coughs> I have every confidence that this council, the mayor, the police chief, and city leadership can develop other methods that will enhance and improve the safety and security of our home without causing harm to others. Uh, the second thing I would like to point out is that I don't believe the mayor's revision addresses the heart of the matter. Uh, it does not address the concerns of many citizens, the concerns of the council. 
there is nothing I could see in the revision that solves for the issues that have been identified. Uh, and after reading some uh, opinion columns and articles, it's even more clear to me that there's a lot of specificity needed in the language to ensure that there are no unintended consequences and that there is proper management and proper limits and everything has been accounted for. <coughs> in closing, I would like to mention that, as I said last meeting, I appreciate the respectful discussion that has been had on this issue. And I want to make sure that everyone knows I am not against a safer downtown or against store owners protecting their spaces. I am advocating that, down, that downtown Northampton is a space for everyone and should be kept as such in every possible manner. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would anyone else like to give public comment? Hello, my name is Sam Gaskin. I'm the general manager of Guild Art Supply downtown at 102 Main Street. I want to speak as someone who sees Main Street all day, every day. Uh, I'd say the biggest problem, you know, I see all arrests, I see everything. I see uh, the more, I see the biggest problem that we have is um, there's an alcove that goes from our storefront uh, through the building to the back parking lot. This is locked at 9 p.m. The biggest problem I see is that uh, homeless people go there to sleep at night, whatever else. And to me, I view that as not an issue of let's get some cameras in there, although the property manager thinks that way. They want to see some cameras, see who's there, catch them in the act. To me, that speaks of um, people not having a warm place to sleep, to be alone, that's quiet. Th th that's all I want to say in reference to that. Sorry, I'm not a great public speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other public comment this evening? No? If not, then we will convene. Uh, and I'll ask that the role of the City Council be called for that purpose. Councilor Bidwell. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labard. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor Nash. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shara. Here. Um, I hope there's no objection to skipping straight to the business at hand this meeting. Um, and so the first up will be the consent agenda, which contains one item, which is the minutes of December 21st of last year. Are there any, are there any removals of the consent agenda? If not, there's a motion to approve. Second. Second. And seconded. All those in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, the consent agenda is uh, has passed. And now we're going to come to... On <coughs> ordinances, uh, reconsideration of measure 17397, an ordinance establishing restrictions on the use of surveillance technology in public places following mayoral veto slash disapproval per section 36 of the charter. Uh, it would be in order to have a motion to approve uh, the ordinance. So moved. Made and seconded. Um, thank you. And if I may, I would like to take an opportunity to explain uh, the process procedurally uh, for the council and for members of the public and those who may be watching uh, at home. Uh, we are meeting tonight uh, within the window provided by law to comply with our obligation under the charter to consider a measure that was uh, vetoed or disapproved by the mayor. Um, the ordinance in question was introduced on September 21st, 2017. It was discussed in City Council on that day. It was considered in three committee meetings, City Services on October 2nd, Legislative Matters on October 16th, and again on November 13th. It was subsequently debated in the City Council on November 16th and December 7th, whereupon it was passed on second reading by a vote of 7 to 2 on that day. Uh, the mayor vetoed the ordinance on December 18th, and in his letter of disapproval, he explained uh, the reasons for his disapproval and suggested a possible rewriting of the ordinance. I think there is potentially some misunderstanding uh, among many that the City Council can simply adopt that rewriting tonight as the City Council's response um, to the veto. This is not the case. Uh, the Charter compels the City Council to consider the ordinance again in the same form that it was previously passed. And that is why we are meeting tonight. Further revisions, whether they are suggested by the mayor or others, would have to come separately in the form of a new ordinance. That ordinance would then have to go through the standard legislative process. For example, it would have to be referred to our Legislative Matters Committee 
uh, per the council rules. We cannot switch one out for the other at the last minute, and even if we could, that would of course not be in the public interest or in the interest of transparent government. So that is the purpose for our meeting tonight, uh, we're fulfilling a legal obligation under the charter. And whether or not the veto is overridden, it would then be possible for other ordinances or amendments to be brought um, in the future. Briefly, for the record, uh, I have discussed this issue um, with the mayor. I have discussed the mayor's uh, proposed rewriting, which is a, a concept, not an ordinance, uh, with him at length. And as I have told him, first of all, I have appreciated the discussion with the mayor. I found him to be accessible and open to discussion, something I, I am very grateful for. I find some of the content of his uh, rewritten language to be very worthy, and some of it, as he knows, uh, to be in need of improvement, and that has been the basis for our discussions. Uh, compromise has to be a two-way street, and so I thank him for engaging in a detailed back and forth with me and the co-sponsors on this topic. Um, as of today, we have not reached an agreement on specific language that might substitute for what the city council passed after a pretty lengthy three, three and a half month process. And I can let the other co-sponsors speak for themselves. That is kind of a long-winded introduction, but it's important that we know the process. We are gathered tonight to vote on the ordinance as was originally passed by the city council. So, discussion. Uh, just a question. So, uh, we're asked to vote on that original ordinance a third time. In essence, it's, yeah, it's almost like a third reading. Okay. Yeah. And so there isn't a process whereby the veto itself needs to have an override by the charter? Does that, or, or if not overridden, it stands and it uh, cancels out this? Uh, well, does the third vote essentially take care of that? It does. Um, the section of the charter that we're looking at um, let me quote part of it. Um, so the mayor shall return a measure within a specific, with specific reasons for the disapproval uh, in, in writing to the city council. The city council shall enter the objections of the mayor on its record and not less than 10 business days nor more than 30 days from the date of its return to the council shall again consider the same measure. If the council notwithstanding such disapproval by the mayor shall again pass, in this case the ordinance, uh, then it shall be deemed enacted, essentially. So that's the process. So discussion in the council. Councilor Nash. Can I inquire as to how close we were to, the, between the sponsors and the mayor, um, how close we were to a, a compromise? Well, speaking for myself, it's, I guess, difficult to quantify a closeness. I can say that um, both the mayor and I think the council co-sponsors um, spoke in good faith and did not reach an agreement. And I'm not sure how to elaborate on that to really answer your question about, about closeness. Councilor Dwight. I, and I'm a little concerned because it's not on the agenda. So it's, it's, it would be difficult to actually talk about something that only exists as a theory that's not posted on the agenda and therefore, therefore wouldn't qualify, uh, at least in the strictest sense of open meeting law. So, but the fact is, the fact that I think to the President's credit, in the interest of full disclosure and being transparent about the process and such as it is, the process has been since our last vote has been behind closed doors. It's not taken place in public. It's not been a deliberative process. It's merely been negotiations, but at the same time does not necessarily afford public uh, the opportunity for the transparency. So should that, should that be realized in any way, it's certainly not at this meeting. It would be at another meeting. Anyone else in the council? Council Bidwell. Um, thank you. <clears throat> what I would 
Give, given where we stand procedurally and given the, 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 the months of, uh, of uh, conversation and, and, and input, what I would like to urge my, my colleagues to do here tonight is to join me in voting against the um, override of the, of the mayor's veto, or in other words, the way we're describing it, to vote uh, against the ordinance, not just because as you've heard me say many times, I think there are a variety of reasons that the ordinance as originally drafted um, is, is unnecessary and is logically inconsistent in a variety of ways. For example, the way it's drafted and the measure we're, we're, we're to vote on tonight would allow cameras on one side of Market Street but not on another side of Market Street, on State Street but not another side of State Street. I just think there are a number of things that I continue to have problems with that will cause me to vote against the ordinance, but it's not with the intent of just killing it, but I, I truly do believe that we can come up with a better ordinance. Um, I truly do believe that we can come up with something, and I think uh, based on the original or based on the language in the mayor's veto message, there's, there's the basis there for coming up with, with something that I believe a majority of us on the council and the mayor and the chief could indeed support. Um, I accept that a majority of the council, uh, for a variety of reasons, constituent input, uh, heartfelt uh, belief, moral belief, for a variety of reasons, there's a majority that does want some further check on the ability of the, the mayor and the chief to install additional cameras. I, I, I accept that. Um, and therefore, I would propose, based on that desire, to, to work with my, my colleagues and others to, in the, in the future, we're not ready to do it tonight, to, to, uh, to come up with, uh, with an alternative. And I, I truly believe that the building blocks um, of such an alternative that could be acceptable, we've identified. We, have an we would have an opportunity to do something that would be consistent throughout the city uh, in its restrictions on cameras, not just one part of downtown. Uh, we would have an opportunity to get more specific and, and, and be clearer on what we mean by public spaces and municipal facilities. Uh, we would have uh, an opportunity to allow, as I think is appropriate, for the possibility that the police <coughs> chief and the mayor might at some time, based on circumstances we can't foresee now, deem it appropriate to recommend uh, some additional cameras. And we would have an opportunity to say that if you're ever gonna do that, here are all the specifics that you need to tell us the council about. Where they would be installed, for what purposes, what they would cost, what the ongoing costs would be. There would then be a public hearing, well noticed, uh, there would be then an opportunity for the council to vote up or down. There would be an, an opportunity in the way I build the, to see the building blocks of such an alternative ordinance, uh, an opportunity to clarify that an ordinance such as this, if it were approved, <coughs> could be overturned or amended at some point in the future. I think these are the ingredients of, uh, of a measure that we could use as the basis for starting the first, starting our new council session and our relationship with the mayor and the police chief at the start of this council session uh, on common ground. I, I, I truly believe that is, is possible. And if the ordinance is not approved tonight, I pledge that I would work with everybody involved to try to make that happen. Anyone else? Um, anyone else who's not spoken? We'll go to Councilor Klein and then Councilor Nash, would that be okay? Councilor Klein, sure. please. Um, I'm going to actually echo the comments of uh, some of the, the folks in the public uh, comment section. A veto is not a compromise. A rewritten ordinance that fundamentally changes the ordinance's effect and meaning is not, as I see it, a seeking of common ground. In fact, the cornerstones or tools of compromise and seeking common ground are collaboration and ongoing conversation. Over the last four months, that conversation did happen with the police chief and the ordinance was in fact um, 
it included a number of modifications that were based on what the sponsors heard from the chief. But truly, there was not an opportunity during that four months for conversation or collaboration with the mayor during the almost four months we deliberated on the ordinance before the mayor issued his veto. On October 2nd, I put uh, in a request for myself and five members of the public to uh, meet with him. We did not hear back. After two weeks, um, I contacted the mayor's office again, asked for a meeting. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm getting over the flu. Um, the group we put together to make this request were people that spanned a spectrum of socioeconomic and political backgrounds and diverse ages, genders, races, professions, and views about the cameras. <coughs> um, two weeks later, when we contacted the mayor's office again, we were finally told that the mayor was not taking meetings about the cameras. As a co-sponsor of the ordinance, I was disappointed, I was frustrated to not be able to share my concerns about the proposal to install cameras and to not have the opportunity to hear directly from the mayor what his views were. The residents I was working with were disappointed too. What leads to compromise and the finding of common ground are conversations, not silence. Some have said that the process around the ordinance was compromised by the way in which the ordinance was brought forward. This claim seems to me to be a bit of a red herring. As city councilors, we respond to issues as they arise. It's our responsibility and obligation. We propose resolutions um, and legislation and ordinances. We conduct vigorous public debate. We listen to and work with members of the community, in this case for the last four months. We conduct relevant research, we ask questions and seek answers, we solicit input from and conversation with relevant parties in the city, like the executive branch, the mayor, and staff, in this case the chief of police, and we adjust and tinker with ordinance based on that input as we feel is appropriate. And we present our thoughts to our peers on the city council. Ultimately, we vote twice not everyone agrees and not everyone votes the same. That's why we vote. Not everyone will be um, happy with the outcome of the votes. I want to talk this one last time, hopefully this one last time, about why I'm committed to restricting surveillance cameras in the city. Here's a fact about our society that I think we all know. Some people have more access than others to elements that are fundamental to maintaining one's dignity and safety. Some people are more at risk of being subjected to oversight and management by the powers that be. I feel that it's among my duties as a city councilor to work ever that much harder to afford those folks, immigrants, people of color, people whose lives are lived more on the street than in the shelter and safety of a home, and many others who are more vulnerable to the <laughs> uses of power than those of us who are lucky and privileged enough to be less scrutinized, um, to afford whatever measures of safety and ease that I can for those vulnerable folks. This very much includes <clears throat> as much assurance as I can possibly offer that they won't be subjected to the indignity of surveillance. There is necessarily a relationship, a power dynamic, between the watcher and the watched, the surveilled and the the surveiller and the surveilled. The entity that surveils is always the one with power. The people who are, surveil, who are surveilled are at risk of being discriminated against, harassed, and handed over to federal authorities, and I don't want to be a part of that. If we accept the mayor's veto and move forward with his heavily revised ordinance, it is not a compromise. It's a complete alteration of the intent of the ordinance that this council passed. <coughs> with a strong majority vote. Our ordinance says, no, we don't want surveillance cameras in our downtown. Conversely, the mayor's revisions allow for the possibility of cameras. His revised ordinance says, yes, we'll consider surveillance cameras in our city, and yes, we'll give the council some possibility of oversight, but far from the oversight that is necessary or practical. That is not what this council voted for. We voted to say no to surveillance in our city. I urge my colleagues to support our ordinance again. Thanks. Thank you, Councilor. Uh, Councilor Nash and Councilor DeBarge. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I'm, I'm going a little off script here. Um, I'm, you know, the, 
I wasn't quite certain as to what was, um, you know, whether there was going to be a compromise and um, so where things were going to land before the meeting. Um, but I'll try a little of it here. So uh, had the mayor simply vetoed uh, the ordinance, my vote for tonight would be simple. I, you know, I would be um, uh, reaffirming our ordinance. It, w it would be very straightforward. The, but, it, um, but it was made difficult by um, the mayor's uh, suggestions. Um, as uh, Councillor O'Donnell has stated, um, that um, that they were worthy of consideration, um, and I agree with this assessment, and that the way we're bound tonight is that the only way to get to these is by letting this version of the ordinance die, and I'm terribly uncomfortable with that pr prospect, um, but I, I, I do want to speak to. Um, the, the mayor's revisions um, that um, the first of all that the mayor's revisions are our ordinance that is our language and he added to it just as if it went out to committee it came back with recommendations that um, that um, I find um, really improve the or the ordinance um, it establishes a process for us citizens and counselors to have a discussion about surveillance technology downtown and everywhere else in the city. We have been missing such a, such a process and we have been um, uh, designing the means to fit the ends. That I think that had we had this process in place from the start that we would have arrived at a different place that we're, we're still searching for that process. And my worry is by simply moving forward tonight and, um, and, and supporting the ordinance that we passed, that we, aren't, we don't have a process to move forward. It's clear for what we're gonna do downtown for central business, but it doesn't, it doesn't tell us what, we, what to do in Florence Center, it doesn't tell us what to do in Leeds, doesn't tell us what to do at Sheldon Field. We're going to do the whole thing over again each time a proposal comes up. Um, <coughs> the mayor's uh, revision creates a framework that requires further discussion of surveillance technology. One of the things that I've been asking for all along is how do we have this continued discussion? How do we weigh out the, the different places between a parking garage, a parking lot, a park, a intersection, this, uh, the mayor's uh, version allows us to have that discussion. Um, within the central business area, um, uh, city properties that will be directly impacted by this are the James House on Gothic Street and its parking lot, the Roundhouse parking lot, Pulaski Park, um, the Armory, Stri Armory Street parking lot, and a possible future transit center on King or Pleasant Street. All will be bound by, by this ordinance if we pass it tonight. Um, what I like about the, 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 the mayor's revision is that um, that we actually get two bites at the apple for um, any proposal that comes forward. It would, any proposal that involves surveillance technology would come to us, we would hold a public hearing, and we'd have to hear what people have to say about it. Furthermore, it would have to come back to us as part of, a, uh, as part of the budget, where we again could vote or disprove it. Um, You know, I, and, and what's difficult here also is that if we don't go forward, if, I, if we don't go forward with this tonight, there's going to be a lot of people who think that I'm, you know, if I were to vote against 
I, I get it all confused. I know. <laughs> if I were to, to uh, not reaffirm our ordinance, that it would go down that I am in support of surveillance technology, which I am completely <laughs> against. I am completely against. What I am in search of is a process that actually works. And, um, and I, I was hoping that tonight we would have some sort of compromise. And um, so, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not quite sure where I'm going to land. Um, I don't want to um, have, uh, I'm concerned if, 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 if this went down, whether there would be a political will to pull something together like Councillor Bidwell was discussing. So, um, I, you know, I, I have to say I, I'm a little disappointed. We haven't found common ground here and that um, I am definitely against cameras. Thank you. Point, quick point, and uh, first of all, remind uh, the public of my request that we maintain silence during these proceedings. Um, thank you. Just point of information quickly, um, it, just so the council knows, um, revisions can be brought whether or not uh, the ordinance is overridden tonight. It does not require that the ordinance fails tonight in order to, for example, expand it to the entire city later. Just wanted to add that procedural note for people to consider. So Councilor LaBarge was next and then Councilor Carney. Um, thank you. I have spent some time going over the mayor's proposed revision to ordinance 17-397. I have the most respect for our mayor, but I do agree on many of his issues and not on some. And this is my thoughts of his proposed revisions. The mayor does not legislate, the city council does. So my question was, why did he legislate after the ordinance passed the council twice? And that, that bothers me. Our mayor is free to weigh in legislation, of course, and he often does. He did state, and he did not state nothing. He let the council expend substantial time and effort on the ordinance and did not offer his input until after both the resolution and the ordinance passed two readings. That bothered me. And I think like with Councillor Nash, I think a lot of what you said is part of what could have been done if our mayor did come forth and participate in the process and it did not happen. I feel that, you know, we went through and expended a substantial amount of time and effort on the ordinance. And we did not hear or hear the mayor offer his input until after both the resolution and the ordinance passed its two readings. Then he rewrote it, is why did he take, why did he not take part in the process prior to the act of vetoing this well thought out ordinance. And it was very well thought out. Nothing prevented our mayor from taking part in the process. Yes, we will hear about the charter and nothing was done illegal. Our mayor is so correct about that when he does say that. He did nothing illegal. The point that many people have talked with me recently within the past week and a half that they felt it was just in bad taste and was disrespectful to the public. And I've stated that before. That's what I've been hearing. And also city council after so many hearings and open public sessions where people spoke. And I think that's so valuable of all the hearings that were put in place and we allowed both sides, our business people people who felt they wanted the surveillance cameras versus people who did not. I just feel, this is my opinion, there was no reason to attack the ordinance after it was passed twice. And that is my thought. 
along with many other people who have spoke to me in Ward 6 and in the city. My husband and I were just at Stop and Shop. It's nonstop where people do not agree with the candidates. The, uh, the mayor points out that the city council has the power to not fund the cameras, and we've heard him say that. That is so true. The federal government could fund the cameras and likely would give the current president and his priorities. I just feel, I think, because of the mayor not participating and coming forth, that he really, really has completely has missed the point. And that yes, a future council could fund the cameras if it choose. And that has been said many times, even Councilor Dwight, as long as we've been councilors, we've heard that. If new councilors come in, they can go ahead and fund. I also feel critically, more importantly, the council is using the strongest power it has the creation of law and the form of city ordinance to condemn a policy that it thinks is completely misguided, the opposite of progressive and will undermine the city's proud sanctuary status. And I will never change my way on that. This is the strongest stance it could take on this important issue, so it is only right that the council use the strongest power it has. I also feel if our mayor had actually had the time, which I wish he did, to be a part of this process, rather than just veto the ordinance after it passed the council <laughs> twice, he may have understood it much better. The mayor wants to make it broader by expanding the program to be citywide. <coughs> He also wants to allow it on public building. This ordinance, which already passed twice, addresses the issue of scope. I just feel, why didn't the mayor suggest changes earlier? Which I feel, where your concern is, we probably could have adjusted and made it some changes. The mayor discusses restrictions versus prohibition. I feel he is legislating again. And why didn't he or our city solicitor raise the issue earlier? The mayor acknowledges that the proposed camera proposal will undermine our sanctuary city status. I believe that he should have signed the ordinance, which passed twice, into law if our mayor wants it to be broader. Why didn't he say so prior to the veto? Why didn't our mayor submit the changes as an amendment? I'm asking that as the counselor. I feel this veto or disapproval means just that, disapproval. If the ordinance wasn't broad enough for our mayor, it simply does not make sense that he would disapprove of the ordinance. Many, many people, again, have mentioned to me that they feel the reasoning in his disapproval misses the point of the ordinance almost entirely. And they feel there is a lack again and again of respect for the public and council. That's what I'm hearing constantly. I really feel our mayor had his hands full of decisions he had to make. You know, please the business community and the police chief in many both sides. And it's very difficult to have to go ahead and please everybody. And you just cannot do that. And city councilors also go through the pr same process. We cannot please everybody. So my feelings are I supported the ordinance twice. I stand where I am because this is exactly what I feel, and I spent a week going over this proposed revision, and this is what I've come out with what I had to say. Thank you, Councilor Clark. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I guess the points that I want to uh, look at are <coughs> uh, about the process. <coughs> there have been some suggestions throughout that <clears throat> the process was flawed. Um, 
and was seriously flawed. And yet um, this was and continues to be, here we are at the final extension, re uh, reading the mayor's veto, right by the book. Everything has been completely by the book. This is how proposals, this is how laws made counselors or one counselor or more bring a, a measure before the council and then it goes out. It's not usually that the conversations happen before. It's that's what starts, that's what jump starts the process is the delivery to the council of a proposal or an ordinance. And um, in this case here, there was, it, that came out of a conversation started by the police, but that made sense to broaden it and to really, to really look at this, which I believe we have over four months extensively. Um, I have, I don't have a problem with uh, the mayor's um, veto and um, uh, proposed revisions, but I think that they, uh, I, I, I think that is by the book too. I mean, that's the way that he, you know, he is allowed by the charter to disapprove and send a letter of explanation. And I see those revisions as being part of that explanation. I do disagree. Um, and I'll continue to support the, the ordinance. And I appreciate the, the aspects of the revisions that look to broaden the scope across the city. I don't see that those can't be incorporated in some po at some point, and I would support that kind of expansion. Um, but I think that there's been enough work and it covers enough ground for people to be able to feel confident now after this third vote that we've done our work, we've really uh, done four months worth of work getting to this point, and we've reviewed. The mayor's done his job in terms of reviewing and submitting his disapproval, and we've reviewed that. Um, so I would ask councilors to join me again in reaffirming this vote for the ordinance. Councilor Dwight. <coughs> I wrote it out just to spare a lot of you. The, um, <laughs> I'm going to speak to this directly to the ordinance as opposed to other things. Now, yeah, obviously, we've been all struggling with this issue for quite a while, as we all noted. We still are. Um, the debate's been influenced by passions and reactions to passions, and is often strayed from the essential facts germane to the ordinance. <clears throat> We've all been lobbied by supporters and opponents of the ordinance and heard hours of community testimony and along with testimonies from the chief. So allow me just to explain my struggle and personal process and, and then my conclusion. And then sometimes it's helpful to employ an analogy when an issue becomes obscured by emotions, it in, uh, obscured by the emotions that that issue inspires. So. Let's try to replace cameras with something almost all of us can agree is unacceptable. In this case, I opted to change out cameras and replace it with racial profiling. I'm morally opposed to both forms of policing. I know the chief is as adamant, if not more, than I am in, in her rejection of racial profiling. But let's say for the moment that a hypothetical police chief submitted a proposal that would include a policy of identifying suspects based on characteristics of race. What would the discussions look like? I mean, in that context, it seems absurd that we would even entertain the notion, but I'm sure there are people in the community who believe that the proposal would have at least some merit and should be considered. At the very least, it shouldn't be prohibited outright by law. Proponents might argue that security should be balanced with individual rights that not enough study has been done to determine the efficacy of this policing tool. Some may even say things like, if you haven't done anything wrong, you have nothing to worry about, or I'm fine with being profiled. If the council started off with a resolution, as we did in this instance, declaring their principled opposition to the concept of racial bias as law enforcement, some would assert that act predetermined the outcome of an ordinance that would establish a restriction. Others would point out that people racially profile all the time. So what difference would it make if the city did it? <laughs> so would we hear arguments that the council's response was an overreach and rash if we responded by drafting laws to resist 
racial profiling is the law enforcement tool used here in the city. All right, now I acknowledge that analogies are only useful to a point, and, but I use this one to describe my intentions and motives for co-sponsoring the resolution and the ordinance. I believe that racial profiling and unwarranted government management surveillance are wrong and run counter to the principles embedded in the Constitution. That has been identified as bias in some testimony. And, and I suppose it is. It's a bias towards upholding my oath of office. Now, for many folks in this debate, the two things, racial profiling and 24-7, 365 monitoring of public space, are not even close to equivalent. But for me and others who have already expressed our opposition of these systems, they are two fingers of the same glove. My opposition to municipal <coughs> control cameras in public spaces stands. And for me, the ordinance we pass is the best assurance we now have to assure that they will not be installed. And that said, though, I will support any means by which we can arrive to the same conclusion, should it come to that. And that conclusion would be, at the very least, no city managed cameras downtown monitoring our public spaces. Thanks. Comment from the council? Council Sharon. Um, <clears throat> just an aside first, I'm not sure how to square the view that the mayor shouldn't be involved in legislative process, <clears throat> but that he should have done it sooner. But um, with that said, I agree with Councillor Carney that uh, I'm completely comfortable with both the legislative and the, the executive process. Um, and I think that it's a real shame that common ground wasn't found. I would have liked something that everyone could have signed on to. I think there's really great value in that. Um, and I was extremely interested in having a substantive deliberation about it. My frustration for the past couple, two, three weeks has been um, that I've heard many, many opinions on the mayor's proposed revisions, but the opinions I've been seeking are the only ones I can't attain, which are from the sponsors and from the other counselors. Um, but at this point, I'm not sure what the value is in discussing a proposal that has evolved. Um, although, like others have mentioned, I have thoughts on the original proposal, um, we aren't able to see it in its evolved form. As Councillor Dwight noted, that was done behind doors and without transparency. And that's frankly very frustrating because I would like to have a real conversation about that. Um, <laughs> So that, that's what I have to say about where I am in this process. Thank you. Anyone else who, Councilor Joy? No, I'm, I'm, now Councilor Murphy hasn't had a chance to speak, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Oh, go, you're on a roll, go ahead. Uh, re <laughs> rel relative to process, and of course this is, process has been criticized and reviewed and vetted, and I'm struck by the irony of the immediate support of a proposal that was not been vetted through any process other than an individual process. And I respect, I actually respect and agree with many of the points that the mayor has made in, in his proposed revisions, and, and, and not the least of which is expanding throughout the city. And I think people should understand that the reason that this one, this ordinance didn't include an expansion throughout the city was it was a possibility that it was too far a reach in order to introduce and that in order not to jeopardize at least addressing an issue that seemed more immediate, it seemed in the best interest to actually deflate it somewhat. And I am and I'm appreciative of the mayor's contributions to that conversation at this stage. But it's been noted, I'm frustrated because, you know, I, I actually appreciate Council Sherra's trying to reconcile on one hand the mayor is not a legislator, on the other hand the mayor hasn't been part of the conversation. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive insofar as I think it would have been very helpful. There are a number of reasons, the mayor and I have discussed this, and there are a number of reasons why it didn't work for him to participate. That said, he didn't participate. So the fact is, is these, inter these items were never introduced, the discussion, even his concerns. So I knew that he supported the cameras and supported the police chief's request but nothing more than that. 
and that was and he and that was discerned usually through uh, his debate while he was cam campaigning. So <clears throat> it's important. I think it's important to reemphasize what the president just said. These two items, the mayor's revisions and this ordinance, are not mutually exclusive. They're not. One does not preclude or exclude the other. That we can incorporate dimensions of, including hearings, um, for every proposal. The fact is, is this actually this mechanism actually allows something similar? It's a heavier lift. It's a little harder. The bar is a little higher. If I'm, I'm, I'm running out of analogies, but the fact is, this one's a little. <laughs> this one has. It's more difficult because it would call for a repeal or an amendment of an existing ordinance, which would still require same, you know, public vetting, discussion, conversation, debate, referral to committees, all the la dee da that comes with all this fun that everyone's become recently educated in. It is my strongest desire that we actually do reaffirm <coughs> what we sussed out and supported in the majority. Common ground, while laudable and, and a desirable pursuit in every aspect, is never achieved because we're disparate creatures with disparate perspectives and attitudes. You're not going to achieve a common ground. Compromise, and how this compromise has been colored has been disturbing to me because there was compromise, there was significant compromise. It was what the, you do in order to negotiate a vote in order to get a majority to pass it. That was a result of compromise. And also in this case, if you consider the two competing parties were not within the council, but without, if, if one of the competing parties was the mayor and the police chief, we didn't hear from the mayor his concerns, but we did hear from the police chief who was very frank and very clear and we incorporated those concerns, or most of those concerns, into the legislation. Now we're talking about a recompromise of a compromise that was voted in the majority that was a compromise that did not come via process of uh, large public discussion and vetting and input from the community, a debate here on the floor. Uh, wasn't a compromise, it was a result. It's a proposal, it's a, it's a proposal of one constituent member who has a stake in it, a stakeholder, very, very, at the very, at the 11th hour and the 59th minute, at the 59th second. To the point where literally we ran out of time, we ran out of the year, the year disappeared, and we find ourselves here in a special meeting. The mayor had nothing to do with the snowstorm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> and, I, and I would not hold him to accounts on that. And I do understand, I, he's explained and I understand, as I said, his, his reasons. That said, how it plays out here on the floor is a bad process, not a good process. What we've done, I still hold, was a good process process, uh, echoing what uh, um, Councilor Carney said. The rest of it hasn't been a process. The rest of it's been a response. And we have to think of it that way. And one, one of the important things, and I think it's been critical throughout the, this mayor's tenure and the reestablishment of the new charter, was jealously protecting the division of powers because that was the most significant point of debate as we voted for a new charter. And the mayor has done his job and protected the power of the executive. We not so much. We have not necessarily been so clear on how we're supposed to prosecute our charge under the charter. Today we do. Today's the time. Today's the opportunity where we make clear that we are doing what we were charged to do, that we affirm the vote that we made in good faith, good process, and good conscience. And I hope we do it one more time and continue to move forward. We will move forward. We will debate this. This, will, this issue doesn't go away. 
I don't want to, I don't want to provide, you know, this is the same thing as establishing a sanctuary city. The promise that was read into it is much greater than the promise that could be delivered. And I think that's true with these cameras. <coughs> the promise of a sanctuary city means we will simply not honor <coughs> ICE requests unless there's a warrant accompanying them. That's not a blanket protection. It is not the, it's not the sanctuary that's offered by the church in Amherst. It's just simply one less, li reducing the likelihood or at least saying we will not be complicit. And I want the same thing here with this ordinance. That's my hope, is that we're not going to be complicit in, in monitoring our citizenry in an unwarranted fashion for the sake of a false sense of security. Thank you. Councillor Murphy, did you want to add something? Yeah. Um, you know, we've heard throughout the process that it was flawed. And I don't think it was flawed in the sense that the council didn't dot the I's and cross the T's and the things that made the ordinance the ordinance and gave it its public hearings and so forth. I, I think where it was flawed was in our assumption that the testimony that we heard in this room, in fact, represents the majority of the people in Northampton. There's a very organized and articulate group of proponents that have been at absolutely every public hearing here and expressed a very strong position on this ordinance. But part of that was to use the word boycott and intimidate and, and actually express the stain for our business community. Absolutely. Uh, I travel in that community and I talk to those folks and they were very intimidated. They're going to boycott my business. Now, I don't think that really would have happened, but at the same time, and I think that was by intent, um, we did not hear from a large population of people that have a financial investment in the city that aren't anybody's enemy, uh, that provide employment and commerce, and they were intimidated out of coming here and talking to us. So I don't think for a moment we can assume that we heard all the voices that we perhaps needed to. And while I'm comfortable as a result of this process, that we probably should have a procedure by which we approve the installation of cameras, because I think it's a sensitive issue. Uh, but I don't think this ordinance has taken into consideration some very important points of view that I think would be willing to compromise and would be willing to say, yeah, I guess we should have a process. The police department shouldn't just be able to stick them up wherever they want to that there should be some way to vet them in, in an intelligent manner um, throughout the city. And in that part of the mayor's um, proposal, I think, is important that it, it should include the entire city and, and it should be a process because we'd be comfortable with that. But I don't think we can assume that we heard all the voices in this room and all the opinions in this room we should have because of intimidation. And the intimidation is the part of the process that was flawed. <coughs> And I'm sort of uncomfortable that maybe we didn't notice that to the level we should have. Uh, I'd also like to take issue with one thing that Councillor Klein had to say, and that was that somehow cameras only focus on people in the minority com community. Uh, the cameras see everybody, the people that support them, the people that don't support them. They see everything. They don't profile. They don't discriminate. They photograph and date stamp. And it, to that extent, I'd I mean, I, I know cameras really well, and uh, for those reasons, I have not supported this ordinance to this point. I will not support it again tonight. It's not that I couldn't support some form of vetting, but I think there were voices uh, that were intimidated out of being part of the process, and I'd like to hear from them at some point. And a brief, um, thank you, a brief reminder about process, it is my hope that we can keep the focus of this debate on the legislation that's before us and the merits of it and how we handle it tonight as is our obligation under the charter and be cautious about straying into issues that may be related but not substantive. Um, Councilor Dwight. I, I just want to be clear on, on my process and I won't speak for the other councilors but um, uh, I actually did go out and sp spoke with a number of business people and 
And in fact, actually, I don't think you've ever heard me advance that I was voting in the majority or representing the majority vote. I would never presume that for the city. I'm, I'm one of the counselors who does not count my phone calls or emails and determines how I'm going to vote based on that. When I run as a representative, I present myself, my scruples, my morals, or my lack thereof, and say, take me as I am. You're going to agree with me sometimes. Other times, you're going to think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fool. But if, you, if you're comfortable enough with the way how I present myself and the way how I conduct my uh, polity, then please offer me your support, and I will try to serve you in the best way possible. You can't serve everybody. It can't be done. Representative government is a compromise. Pardon the use of the word again, but it is a compromise. It's a structure that's designed to do that. So I've never, you're arguing a case I never made, and I never heard made on this floor. I didn't hear in the course of the debate. You hear it in the public, <coughs> but I, I don't think we should confu confuse public testimony with debate and or motivation for, for voting. And I did, I made a point of actually soliciting the opinions of business owners who felt intimidated, they did, I agree, um, from speaking out. And you know, that's somewhat unusual usually because when we have issues that we debate, there are large constituencies that are <laughs> concerned about speaking in public for a variety of reasons. We rarely go solicit them. We don't go seek them out. <laughs> and, I, and to that point, none of that speaks to the order. It speaks to the process. And I understand the frustration of some people in some case who are usually enjoy some sense of of uh, uh, dynamic participation in the uh, process who felt excluded this time. But we also heard from a number of people who've never participated before either. To that end, I would say the process was a success in that level. At the same time, it did not inform my debate or my advocacy for this particular order. So I, I wanted that to be clear. Other, other comments from the council? Move the question, or I'll defer to the president if you have more to say. Well, just just briefly, I think this has been a hard issue for the council. It's been a very long process. I can't say I'm thrilled at the idea of four more months of working on this, but I was certainly happy to invest four months previously on an issue that I thought was important. The issues where we have automatic agreement at the, at the outset don't require much discussion because we already agree. Disagreement becomes relevant when we have an issue that really matters. And things can get a little heated, but at the end of the day, it's okay to disagree with each other. What I'm concerned about is having, at the, at the end of a process after 10 meetings, Having an ordinance passed twice by the city council, presumably it passed because we believe in it. Maybe it's not perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. And we, we by large majorities, approved of it. My concern is at the last minute, not to say at the last minute is unethical or illegal. A veto is a legal um, action to take. But here we are. At the last minute, we seem to be debating a new question. We're debating the ordinance that this council passed twice, twice in a row. And we're comparing it against what? I'm not sure. We're comparing it against something that's amorphous. It's unclear. It hasn't been settled. I'm concerned it would be irresponsible, speaking for myself, to reject the ordinance that is concrete, that is written on paper, that has been vetted that has been through a substantial public process, which I believe in, for an ordinance that is not written, for an agreement that has not been struck. I'm not sure how we can responsibly trade one for the other. I think our responsibility is to vote on the ordinance that this council passed twice. That's our responsibility under the Charter. Um, 
I do think it is time to call the question, not just tonight, mm -hmm. but after four months. <laughs> um, I think if you believe in what this ordinance does, this is a conscience vote like all of our votes. If you believe that this ordinance within the central business district makes our city better, it sets up a restriction on the use of cameras. Not that different in some ways than, than bringing a request for an approval to the council. There is a process. We can amend the ordinance. If you believe in creating a restriction for downtown, and that was in response to what the proposal was, a proposal for downtown cameras, if you believe that we should have that restriction, uh, I would hope that the council reaffirms its votes. I couldn't quite square it when I go back to my constituents and they ask me, why did the council pass this twice and then at the last minute jettison it for something that was unclear? Mm -hmm. No matter, no questioning people's intentions, but it, it was substituted for something that's unclear. I don't know how I could explain that to the people that I represent, which is the whole city. So I will be voting yes on this ordinance, and six votes will be required to enact it into law. So with that, it uh, sounds like we can take a roll call of the council. Okay. Councilor Bidwell? No. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? No. Councilor Nash? Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shera? Yes. The uh, uh, ordinance received seven votes in the affirmative, two in the negative, so it is enacted. Any opposed to adjournment? All those who say aye. 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 Yes, for adjournment.